Thank you, Vice President Lee. I'm Rod Ruoff, Director of the Institute for Basic Science, Center for Multidimensional Carbon Materials, and also a professor at UNIST. It's been a great pleasure of mine to have Roald Hoffman hosting me when I have traveled to Ithaca, New York, and given talks at Cornell for over the last uh, or past 10 years. And it's a wonderful uh, delight to be able to host uh, Roald for the talk that he's going to present to all of us at UNIST and to all of us at the IBS CMCM. Thank you very much. Good morning. I am Jae Young Lee, Vice President of UNIST for Research and Academic Affairs. It's a great honor for us to host the Nobel Prize winning chemist, Professor Ronald Hoffman of Cornell University, with the assistance of Professor Rod Ralph. His presentation is about the chemical bond, and I'm very confident that the special talk will greatly benefit for our faculty, researchers, and students. We are very grateful for your time, Professor Hoffman, and I hope all the participants will enjoy today's talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I hope that all of my friends in Korea uh, can hear me. Uh, it is evening there. It is morning uh, where you are. Thank you all for coming. Um, I should tell you that uh, my voice is a little weak because I have uh, a frozen vocal cord. It's not something one thinks about. What it means that I'm, I cannot, I can no longer sing opera in the shower. <laughs> but aside from that, I may also find myself getting hoarse as we go along. And we will, um, if you hear that, it's just the effects of that. So this is a two hour lecture with a small break. And also the um, the lecture is being recorded. You're welcome to uh, hear it and take it. And also there is a PDF which we can easily make available to people as, but this this lecture is not has not been written up. It doesn't exist in print. So you are hearing it as it is now as a happening. So let's talk about the bond. Uh, bonds are have been with, chemistry from the beginning. A little bit about the history of, of uh, chemistry, which would take much more energy than I have here. It begins with the idea of an element in the 17th century, Dalton's idea of the atom. You will see that Lavoisier does not appear in this list. The idea of a molecule around the beginning of 18th and 19th century, and then there is a incredible period in the middle of the 19th century when there is enough chemical knowledge that people begin to think about uh, molecules, about what holds the atoms and molecules together. And you see here the various names, um, including Kekulé, who figures prominently. Then in 1874, uh, I'll come back to these different representations in just a moment. In 1874, we have the three-dimensional representation of organic molecules with Van Hoff and Lebel, and the tetrahedral carbon atom comes into play. And then in around the First World War, there is a simultaneous description of the chemical bond as a shared electron pair as the new electron theory comes into being with G. N. Lewis and Walter Kossel. Just around the same time, uh, there is the invention and use 
of chemical crystallography and the structures of diamond and graphite get done for the first time. And this is uh, a very important period. It's also very interesting how chemistry and physics do not interact in this or do. Then there comes quantum mechanics, the new quantum mechanics in the late 20s, and with it, the idea of a chemical bond as a quantum mechanical phenomenon with the Heitler and London picture of H2 and then competing valence bond and MO theories from then on. Uh, much of this is described in these three books that I show below, especially that interesting period in the 50s, uh, 1850s, <laughs> is, of, is described very well in Alan Rock's book, Image and Reality, about Kekulé and Kopp. Um, I want to give you some idea of that period, because I think there is nothing in your textbooks that is going to tell you about this. So this is the, the various ways that people had of thinking about what holds molecules together. So they had the symbols. The symbols were there from 1830 because of the dominant authority of a Swedish chemist, Berzelius. So one had C-H-O with the same meaning as we have. They didn't have the atomic weights, right. They had them relatively speaking, but on some scales, O was eight relative to hydrogen one, but then um, uh, on some scales, O was 16. For those people who exist today, who think the world is as simple as their minds are, the formula of water, of course, had to be OH and not H2O. And for those people, they got the atomic weight of oxygen wrong uh, because they didn't realize that there were two hydrogen atoms. But anyway, people somehow felt that things stuck together and had various ways of expressing it. And Kekulé himself ran through about four different formulas. And these are described in that rock book. You can see sort of how they, do you see that? Um, let's see if I can activate my pointer better, but I think you can see it. Can you see my arrow moving? Yes. Yes, okay. So do you see that formula with the brackets? That looks crazy, right? But all it is, is someone desperately trying to tell you that, that C2H4 is bonded to O and it's also bonded to H. And they have other ways of representing it, as you see it at upper left. You see the dash, dotted lines in at the bottom. Some of the formulas are wrong. Some are. One of the things that, that was happening is they there was an agreement on the element structures, on the, on the element symbols, but there was no agreement on whether to use the to put the stoichiometric sub, uh, subscript as subscripts or superscripts. So what you see here, for instance, in the formulas at lower right, is you see that the twos are on the H's as superscripts. That's because some people are there. In general, if there are two ways of saying things, and if there are two people in the world, they're going to say them in different ways. And that's part of the story that you are seeing over here. Up at the top, you see Kekulé's sausage formula. This is a way of expressing not that carbon has four, it's nothing about atomic weights. It's about the combining ability of carbon. So when he draws, when he wants to write a formula for methyl chloride, he writes a carbon with four balls, which is linked three of them to hydrogens. You see the white balls. This is actually Kekulé's model, which exists to this day. Um, and, and then one of the valences, as we might call it, is to a chlorine, and it's a real iron bar that was welded on there. 
up after a while you get to to see this perfectly well for instance at upper right you'll see a Kekulé formula for acetic acid which is a CH3 you see that connected by a single bond to another C which is connected by two valences to an O which is connected by a single valence to another O that's connected by a single valence to an H. You really have to know what's connected to what, but you can make these out pretty well for what they are. These grew in popularity. Eventually, they came to look like what we have today. These are called 19th century type formulas, like uh, C6H5-methyl. That's a formula for toluene there. Um, and uh, in time, people began to draw lines, and the lines represented, like the metal bars in the previous ones, in the previous drawing, they represented a connection. So an OH was a grouping, and C6H5 was a grouping, and the two were connected and they first separated in parentheses. Then they drew a line to the, and then one day somebody broke into the OH bond of phenol. That's the molecule in the middle at the top. And when they did that and could do it, they drew a line to the hydrogen. So that line could be made or broken. If you pushed people in that period and people did ask them, what do you know, what does this mean? Then they, in when asked officially about it, they grew agnostic. That is, they grew, they said, we don't know what it means, but it's connected to that in some way. So that's what the meaning was in the middle of the 19th century. In time, they grew structural formulas. Some atoms were omitted, like in this middle formula for phenol. And then came the period of the Lewis structures. And Lewis and Kossel interpreted the line as an electron pair. This was a response to the physics of their day, which involved only the Bohr model at best. Um, but they connected the line to an electron pair. And then there came Linus Pauling, which gave it an interpretation using the Heitler London calculations, that that line is really a wave function whose square gave you the density, but into which you could put an electron pair. All along the way, they, they kept the previous formalism. So what is, this is a very interesting story in a philosophy of science, and one could go on for this for a while. Basically, what you have here is a group of intelligent people who need a symbol for, for something connected to something else. They want to represent it. They can represent it either in symbolic representation, can be either symbolic or iconic. What does that mean, this fancy language? Symbolic means, iconic means a no smoking sign. Everyone knows what it means. Symbolic is a sign at right, which means nothing to Americans, zero, because we don't use those signs. Does it mean anything to Koreans? Well, uh, maybe, yes, but it doesn't hurt to add a lexical component to it to tell you that it means no parking. A European would have no trouble with what I just showed you here would not park if you saw the sign at right. So this is symbolic. Chemistry is full of symbolic and iconic representations. H2O, I hope you don't think that hydrogen atoms have an H painted on them. It's just a symbol. Uh, but that there are two hydrogen atoms per one O in water, that's, that's iconic. That's a real, rep it's a representation that tells you something. In time, it is in the nature of representations that no matter how much you tell people that we don't really know what that line means, 
people will begin to think that the line is a piece of wood or steel or something connecting those things together. This is something that philosophers know. They've given it a word. It's a fancy English word, reification. Uh, and what it means is ideas that turn solid. What my friend Emily Gressholtz, who's a poet and a philosopher, calls that ideas become the furniture of the mind. We carry around certain representations that are more realistic than they should be, is another way of saying it. And that is exactly what happened. The story is more complicated. This is a story of reification for sure, how those lines became solid. It's also a story of how tools and concepts change. It is a story not of revolution. People did not say one day a line means a quantum mechanical function. They'd be crazy to do that. Pauling never did that. He just identified it with what Lewis called a shared electron pair, and Lewis identified it with what chemists called a connection. It's gradual, punctuated change with appropriation, co-option, parallel and ambiguous terminologies. It's hardly ever malicious because people are just trying to understand. It's very human and it's mostly productive. And for those of you who know, who've read a little in philosophy of science, it's not exactly Thomas Kuhn, it's not quite Feyerabend, who was a destructive genius, but it's maybe a little like Peter Gallison. That is what is their ideas about what is going on. Okay, and what do we have today? Today, I'm going to tell you that we have what looks to be a vague statement, but a very rich one, which I hope I will, that I think you know many dimensions of this. And I, I hope just to wake up in your mind, your knowledge already of all the dimensions of what a chemical bond is. And that is a reasonably persistent connection between atoms. The reasonably persistent is because there is something in there about uh, temperature that is at 10,000 de degrees, that bond between the two hydrogen atoms is not going to stay, though it's not going to stay as a hydrogen molecule for very long. Um, there, it has reasonably persistent at ambient earth conditions. This is gonna come out more directly when we study as we are now, the atmosphere of different, um, of different uh, bodies in the solar system and eventually of exoplanets. But it's a reasonably persistent, means it stays for some time. We'll see something about the time scale in a while. In the first hour, I'm going to talk with you entirely about experimental ways of probing bonding. Talk a lot about distances, something about energies and force constants, something about bonding densities, uh, too little about ma magnetism and spectroscopic criteria, and at the end, some uh, opinionated comments about scanning, tunneling microscopy, and other recent methods. In we cannot go back in time. We now know that there are in a molecule quantized electronic states. And each of those electronic states for a molecule or for a diatomic molecule, let's say, has certain quantized vibrational levels and in turn quantized rotational levels. And that this picture with a different with a potential energy curve and with different vibrational levels is just meant to remind you that this is one way for sure that temperature comes in. That is when the temperature is high, the molecule is 
not predominantly in its lowest vibrational level. And then its effective distance and dissociation energy will be different from what it is when it is at a lower temperature. Uh, so let's talk about distances first. Okay, uh, for about 100 to 200 kilo dollars, you can buy an X-ray diffectometer for molecules, a simple one. Um, and you see one here, you get a diffraction pattern, something worked out, uh, observed at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. And then eventually the technology to generate Fourier maps, as you see here at lower right, and eventually the structure of the atoms is, uh, becomes available. When I was in graduate school, this would be a project of a half year to a year's length for a reasonable molecule. Today, it can be done in about one hour if the molecule cooperates on giving you crystals. And there are ways to get around if it doesn't cooperate. This has been done by human beings for now just about 100 years in great amounts. And to be specific, more than chemists in 200 years of frenetic activity have made about 200 million distinct substances that were not on earth before, as well as duplicating a number that were on earth. About one million, one and a half million of these have had their single crystal X-ray structure done. They have been compiled in the Cambridge Structural Database for organic molecules and for inorganic molecules in two or more different structural databases. These databases are an immense source of information, much underused by theoretical chemists and by other people. And you should certainly become acquainted with these. And I'll show you various ways uh, which are astounding, which can be used. If today you want the length of a CC single bond, <laughs> like that in ethane, between two carbons that are four coordinate, do not ask a theoretician. Go to the Cambridge Structural Database and ask it, give me all the bond lengths you have for between two carbons that each have three other groups attached to them. And the Cambridge Structural Database will at that point answer, you don't really mean that. And what it, what it's, what it means to say is, I have about 250 million such, such, structure, such distances. So what happened here was Jay Siegel uh, asked it, okay, database, give me the first 10,000. So it did. And that's the histogram it plots out. And from this, you learn that the average CC bond lengths, notice that when you have, when you have a million structures, it doesn't matter if some of them are poor structures. Some of them will be done by people who are not careful. It doesn't matter because there are so many of them. The large numbers will save you. And some of them are good, some are bad. You can even see from this picture that it's easier to stretch a CC bond than it is to compress it. Can you see it? This this distribution is a little asymmetrical on the long side. So there's lots of information you can learn about this. Other bonds, things are different. Here's for instance, if you ask the Cambridge Structural Database for II distances. Now, rather amusing, uh, the, the, the iodine molecule, which I'll show you the structure of it in one of the next slides, the iodine molecule itself is not in the Cambridge Structural Database. Why is that? That's because the database 
was constructed initially in the 1950s when the world was ruled by organic chemists. An organic chemist determined that into the Cambridge Structural Database, you had to be organic to enter. That meant that you have to have at least one carbon and hydrogen. And iodine was poor. It didn't have a carbon or a hydrogen. So what are these compounds that are in here? Well, they are iodides, which have also some organic matter around. But iodine is actually at 2.66 here. You notice that there is a long tail here. That tail is not bonding. If you have an iodide and you draw a sphere around it, in that spherical shell, if there are two iodines in the molecule, the chances are that you'll find another iodine proportional to the volume of that spherical shell. So that's, that's what's happening here at long distances. But the things in between are very interesting. Uh, here is the iodine uh, molecule itself, the structure, uh, which I had to go to the inorganic database to get. Incidentally, if you want to know what is a Van der Waals contact between two iodines, do not ask a theoretical chemist. Go to the database and look there for non-bonded iodine-iodine contacts. And you'll see they are 3.50 or 4.27. Uh, those are the non-bonded ones that, that one sees there. Only less than an angstrom. Interesting, isn't it? That the non-bonded, the Van der Waals contact is less than an angstrom longer than the bonded one. Um, not that the bond is very strong in this one. Um, you, every one of the features of this is a source of theoretical problems. It's it's just, it's been wonderful in my life and others to explore all the distances. For instance, you will see there is a big peak around 2.9 for iodine-iodine distance. What the heck is that? Those are triiodide ions. A triiodide ion, notice the numbers here, 300, 400. That means there are that many crystal structures. There are that many distances that are in the database. Um, the triiodide is an I2 interacting with an iodide to give a symmetrical, usually, uh, but sometimes asymmetrical, I3 minus. And this is a classical three center four electron system and is the source of a lot of interesting things about that. If you want, here is one of the two great papers of this decade that are not known as well as they should be. Uh, here is an incredible paper that Santiago Alvarez did in 2013, 10 years ago. He decided to probe the Cambridge Structural Database for Van der Waals distances. And he decided he, he was agnostic to begin with. He said, I, I don't believe there is such a thing as a Van der Waals distance. So what he did was he did it here. He looked at all the bonds which were from any of the 96 elements or so to oxygen, not bonds, distances that were in a Cambridge base. And that excludes a lot of purely inorganic compounds. But he did that. So here is one. I, show, I pick out for you two, two ones you wouldn't think of, like strontium oxygen or rhodium oxygen. OK? Not CO. CO is boring. We know what happens with CO. But let's look at this. So what you see is two large peaks at short distances. Those are the dative bonds. These strontiums or rhodiums are being coordinated by some oxygen containing inorganic ligands like carboxylate or something like that. And then you see this rapidly rising curve that goes as R squared. That's the distant contacts which have. And then you see this bump. Do you see the bumps? 
You don't have to be blind. You don't have to be prejudiced, rather, to see that there are bumps. These bumps, let me translate that into English. That's a number of molecules which show you a distance that is sure, that is longer than a bond, clearly, but still a prominent distance. This is a Van der Waals contact. With this, he has gotten Van der Waals distances, radii for uh, all the elements. We have gotten it in another way in my group. And he here are plotted from another paper he did uh, in 2008, are plotted the covalent radii. So those are the distances between two atoms in a single bonded molecule, like II is, um, would be 2.66, and then you would have half of that as the, as the covalent radius. Using these, he has in a recent paper done an absolutely incredible thing. Uh, I'll show you what the paper is. It's here. It was out just earlier this year. I don't even have a page reference in to, uh, chemical science. It's called The Borderless World of Chemical Bonding Across the Van der Waals Crust and the Valence Region. So what he has done is what is so obvious that you could kick yourself in the behind for not having done it, for someone not having done it. He's taken two atoms and he's drawn here a sphere, which is the Van der Waals distance. He got them from here, okay? That's the VA is for a, uh, for a covalent rate, uh, sorry, the RA is the covalent radius of it. And the VA is the Van der Waals radius. The Van der Waals radius is always bigger than the covalent one. And then he has looked in many places for the distance in molecules when compared to these two. And he's defined a, uh, a penetration, which is here called IAB, which is the distance inside the sum of the two one. You add up the two one twelve radii, that's two atoms touching, but not bonding. And now you measure how much they penetrate between that from the structure. This is not quantum mechanics. This is geometry and the Cambridge file. And this IAB gives you the interpenetration of the Van der Waals regions. He defines this difference between the sum of the this, and then he defines a penetration index. This penetration index sounds complicated, but let me tell you how, how simple it is. If the two atoms are touching at the Van der Waals radius, the penetration is zero. That's how he defines it. If the two atoms are forming a single bond, the penetration is 100%. Okay? He's defined them this way. And now everything in between falls into place. If you have some partial bonding, Notice he's not telling you why. He's not telling you why. He's just looking at whether it occurs. That's why this is so obvious. Um, so that's partial bonding. And uh, sometimes there's a lot of partial bonding. Sometimes there can be a double bond or a triple bond between atoms. And then the penetration will be bigger than 100%. 100% is the single bond. Okay. so. He ha there is an incredible table in this, in which he has assembled, in this incredible figure, he has assembled every theoretical idea that people have had about structures and showed how much penetration corresponds to them by this measure. So here is just to throw out an idea, hydrogen bonding. You know it occurs. It can be weak, it can be strong. It's somewhere there in this 
uh, you can see it over here. There are halogen bonds, which I don't believe in. There are interactions between metals. So you see, you don't have to be believe it or not believe it or where it comes from. Uh, so, but the facts are there and the penetration is very clear. And this is a beautiful, beautiful and simple way to illustrate partial bonding and at least to decide for a theoretician, is this worth worrying about? Or should I just forget about it? Uh, and this is what this is good for. I could go on for longer, but you can look at the papers. I have to leave distances. So part of my problem was I took my PhD with a crystallographer with Lipscomb. So it's very hard for me to leave distances, um, but I have to leave. Let's talk about bond energies. Bond energies, you remember, is the strength to break the bond. So there's a problem with bond energies that the most straightforward way to measure them you want to measure the bond energy of a CC bond in ethane? Heat the hell out of ethane and measure at what point do you get methyl radicals detected in one way or another. Yes, now supposing someone asked you what is the CH bond energy in ethane? And all of a sudden you're in trouble because when you heat up ethane, it breaks into two methyl radicals. It doesn't want to answer your question directly. But people have gotten around this with the help of thermochemistry. It's very ingenious, and it's usually obtained by photoionization mass spectrometry. Let me sketch for you how one obtains a CH bond energy in ethane. So what they do is, you can read more about it in this paper by Blanksby and Ellison. You can photoionize ethane, which with light, don't try to do this with visible light. You need ultraviolet, obviously. Uh, if you shine light of variable energy, you can get the threshold very exactly for photoionization to give ethyl cation and a hydrogen and an electron. That's actually what happens in this ionization. You can, in another experiment, you can generate ethyl cations, CH3, CH2 plus, and you can measure the electron attachment to them, which actually is the reverse of the photoionization of ethyl radical, which is not that easy to get. And if you add up these two experiments, if you don't, one of the things that you've learned about thermodynamics is it works. Uh, and if you add up these two equations, you get the equation that you want. So two precise measurements can give you a bond energy. And this is how most bond energies for bonds that refuse to cooperate by simple dissociation are measured today. It's an interesting story. It's not done for very many things because sometimes it's difficult to do the reactions. Bond dissociation energies in general go as expected. A double bond is stronger than a single bond, so it takes not quite twice, but more than almost twice as much to break uh, ethylene into two CH2s. Um, sometimes there are strange things. One of the most interesting things uh, that of the surprises, and I'm not going to explain it to you today, but I could, is that when you go from carbon to silicon, uh, things change, it takes, a lot of energy to break a silicon silicon single bond, but it takes little energy to break a silicon silicon double bond. Isn't that strange? And why is that so? Um, that has something to do with the stability of the carbenes. I've given it away. Uh, result silicon is weird, of course, but very interesting. It's my favorite element for a number of reasons. Um, 
In general, bond dissociation energies correlate with bond distances in the obvious sense that stronger bonds are shorter and weaker bonds are longer, but not always true. We've known this all along. Here is C2. C2 is something we've all seen in hydrocarbon flames, but it's not a molecule you can have in a bottle. It's a very uh, kinetically unstable molecule. It, it polymerizes polymerizes to give soot. That's what happens to, to the C2 and hydrocarbon flames. But we, we can, we ha have information about 17, about the ground state and 17 excited states of C2. And notice here the bond lengths. I, for those of you who know bond lengths in organic molecules, you might be amused, and I'll come back to this at the end, that C2 in its bond distance is playing out the whole game of organic chemistry. The range of bond lengths is between that of an acetylene and an ethane in the C2 molecule by itself, which is interesting. Okay, but look at these potential energy curves. You notice here, I'm pointing to a bond that is shorter than the ground state, but weaker. It doesn't happen often, but it happens. Sometimes there are double minima in these curves. There are strange things sometimes, potential <laughs> energy. But in general, the correlation works. Let's talk about force constants. So force constants have to do with the idea that for most molecules near the equilibrium, for most molecules, not all, near equilibrium, the usual potential energy curve is approximately harmonic meaning like that of a harmonic oscillator, meaning as coupled by a simple spring, and then the frequency is uh, related to, inversely related to the square root of the mass and related to a force constant. So that one measure of the strength of bonds, so this is the strength of the, of the spring that's holding it together, viewed in a completely classical way. Okay. This has not been done very often for molecules in our times, but vibrations are very important. Here's the vibrational, typical vibrational spectrum of some molecule. This is the OH uh, stretch influenced by a, uh, it, it's used for diagnostic analytical value. Uh, people do, but one of the places where I'm, I'm very, I'm amused when when influences from outside influence the fashion of subfields of chemistry inside the field. So you might think spectroscopy, uh, that vibrational rotational spectra are old hat. They are for molecules, but then you haven't looked at what's coming off the spectrum of a star or when that star shines through the atmosphere of an exoplanet. This is a little piece of the cloud in Sagittarius of the spectrum. Here are two little pieces. You will see here thousands, if not millions of lines at this resolution, each of those involving some sort of vibrational and rotational characteristic of the molecules that are there. So uh, you, you don't get this out, you do get some complex spectra from atoms, but to get spectra of this complexity, you need actually molecules. Vibrations. So in the old days, people would do a vibrational analysis. And what a vibrational analysis meant is that you attached springs to the various bonds Here's, for instance, a molecule with a carbon with three CH2s above an iron. One put a spring to carbon to the iron. One put a spring from the iron maybe to the neighboring carbon. Springs for CO. And then one, uh, one did a self-consistent optimization 
to see what would reproduce the vibrational spectrum. This was a, an, an, a very underdetermined problem. And what happened here was this molecule was made and then two groups did a vibrational analysis on it. I had to go back to 1975 to, to find this. And so they did this and the force constants, these are the force constants K that are in this equation up there, the K there that fit this. And they agree pretty well for the strong stretching of carbon monoxide. That's a very stiff spring for carbon monoxide. The very, very loose spring for some of the others. But sometimes they differ even in sign. And uh, as uh, one of the writers said, we believe that most force constants which have been derived from large symmetry blocks should be regarded with skepticism. Uh, the assignments may be incorrect. The assumptions are made. This is a very honest scientist, which is what Foyle Miller was, who wrote this. Um, I might just make a parenthetical comment um, that two groups should study the same molecule and do a vibrational analysis for it. That is the worst thing that could happen for the second group to publish but it's the best thing that could happen for science because it is only in this way when two groups unprejudiced by their colleagues work repeat the same work that you really learn what uncertainties and standard deviations mean. Everyone knows how to do a statistical analysis. That's not what this is about. This is about differences in equipment, perhaps about systematic errors, assumptions. This is wonderful to have this, uh, but I wish we had more of it. There's a triple correlation. Usually the stiffer the spring, the shorter the bond, the, the bigger the dissociation energy, but not always, not always. There are some, there are exceptions to this uh, all along, but it's a general correlation. It's known as Badger's rule. Okay, now this is something interesting, which I, again, don't have time to discuss in that much detail, but with time, X-ray crystallography and neutron diffraction became so good that you could get out electron densities of the atoms in the molecule. I'm not talking about distances. I'm talking about the electron density because it's the electrons that are doing the scattering. Um, and so this is the work of a master, Phil Coppins, who used who was at State University of New York at Buffalo. And he does methylcarbamate here. And he does a combination of X-ray diffraction at several temperatures and neutron diffraction. And the red lines here are experimental electron density contours, not theoretical, not calculations. So that's very interesting. Uh, it's of course, big centers around the atoms. Now we have to talk about that because it's important, except for the hydrogen, which doesn't. So what are those big, big clumps of electron density around the atoms? Those are the cores. So let's look a little bit at another molecule. This is BF3, a nice normal trigonal planar molecule. The plot at lower left is the electron density um, map in the plane of the BF3. The map at right is the electron density in a perpendicular plane containing a BF bond. What you see is that the peaks of the electron density, of course, are at the atom. 
except chemists are prejudiced not to have them there because chemists are prejudiced to see bonds. They want to see these lines and they have forgotten that the B and especially the F have got a core of two electrons in the 1S and then for the fluorine, five more electrons uh, in the 2P and two electrons in the 2S. So this is, this, it's that what you are seeing. And so our prejudice, our reification of the bond makes us think that a bond is a region of a maximum of electron density. Okay, this is not true. The bond is a minimum. A maximum in two directions, perpendicular to the bond. Perpendicular to a bond, it's a maximum. So it, it, it is maximum. But along the bond, it's actually a little bit of an addition to what comes there from the overlap of the 1S and the 2S in the middle. And this is very hard to get used to. And this is for a bond. This is a BF bond. This is not a weak bond. This is not a hydrogen bond. This bond takes 712 kilojoules to break apart, but it doesn't have much electron density in the middle of it, as you see over here. Actually, this led to a very interesting episode where when the first, when those crystal structures gave the electron density, what people thought is, okay, so the, the fluorine two, it's due to the 1S and the 2S and the 2P of the fluorine. So what I'll do is if I want the bond density in the F2 molecule, what I'll do is I'll subtract from the bond, from the observed or calculated, you can do a pretty damn good calculation today on F2, uh, calculated electron density, I'll subtract out the fluorine atoms and I'll get what the bond contributed. Ha, huh. this is what happens. These are density difference maps for H2 and F2. H2 is 104 kilocalories bond, F2 is only about 35. When you, uh, so what should you subtract? Of course, spherical atoms, why not? That's the obvious thing to subtract. Well, when you do that, you get a reasonable result for H2. Solid lines means an excess, dashed lines means an deficiency, the integral over the whole graph is zero. This is a density difference map. Now look for F2, what happens? There is a deficiency of electrons in the bond region. And instead it builds up where you have lone pairs on the fluorine. This is weird stuff. Uh, so what has happened here? Eugen Schwartz, whose name is mentioned here, got this explained. What happens is that uh, you should not be subtracting the spherical atoms. You should be subtracting atoms prepared for bonding, polarized by the field of the neighboring nucleus. Now, let me translate that. It means that what you should be subtracting is what you know to be the answer. That is the, the, you have to, the fluorine, the, the fluorine density you should be subtracting is not spherical, but such that it's polarized away from the fluorine, from the neighboring fluorine. So this is, this has turned out to be a dead end for analyzing bonding, getting it by subtracting the electron density. Okay, we have 
all this and I've gone through half of this and I've got five minutes. So uh, let's go on a little bit. Magnetic criteria generally apply to weak bonds. And the general picture is this. If you have two levels, a bonding and an anti-bonding level, oops. here's a bonding level, for some reason I call it A, and an anti-bonding level here. And if I have two electrons, you can have six microstates, a triplet and three singlets. Um, and um, the question is, is there a bond? Uh, what are the orbitals involved? This is the molecule here, is a typical inorganic molecule. Two copper centers. And the coppers are each coordinated, bonded to the other copper, coordinated by carboxylates. A methyl CO2 minus. This is copper two, which is D9, which has one unpaired electron. The one unpaired electron is in an X squared minus Y squared orbital. I'm asking you to believe a lot that we know about this. And now the question, is there a bond between these two orbitals? So the question of a bond or no bond is usually put, the magnetic criterion is applied in terms of, is it a singlet or a triplet ground state? If there are two levels which come from weak coupling, a weak bond between two molecules, and if there are two levels, and if the splitting is large, the ground state will be a singlet. There is no way that a triplet will be, the, that a high spin compound will be. On the other hand, when the two levels are close together, you will get ferromagnetism or a high spin ground state. So the splitting of the levels is related to the bonding and the magnetism tells you something about singlet and triplet and that it can have. So, this is used uh, for, for in a magnetic way. A similar thing is used spectroscopically. The situation there spectroscopically is you have two levels. They either interact and still two electrons. Now what you're looking is not the magnetism, but the excitation energy from the bonding level to the anti-bonding level. And that excitation energy can be large, that's when you have a bond thing situation, or it can be small. So what you're looking for is red or blue shifts of an electronic transition. That is at the heart of spectroscopic measures of bonding. Okay, let's talk about, I haven't done justice to this. I haven't done, I haven't talked about NMR coupling constants, still another story to take up with you. But let me say something about STM. So a marvelous discovery. Who could have imagined that you could get such fine resolution in terms of moving a metal tip and a conducting sample or a molecule and a conducting sample, that you could get such fine control both in both x, y, and z, if z is the direction perpendicular. And you remember how we were all astounded when we saw the silicon 111 seven by seven reconstruction actually come out as a result of one of the first of the scanning tunneling microscope. Given I know the scientists involved, they're very good people. They were, however, employees of IBM. And what happened next was IBM hype got hold of this. Um, and so um, <clears throat> the typical thing was, uh, there was a picture of a bearded white man and the caption under it was, now, 2,500 years after Democritus, we finally could see atoms. Well, I nearly went through the ceiling at that because what astounded me was how without seeing atoms on a basis 
of experiments by clever human beings and their tools, we could get the arrangement of atoms in a complex molecule without seeing the atoms. That's what I was impressed by. And uh, where have we gone now after how many years is it since the development of the STM? Um, we've gone a good way, but the atomic resolution or subatomic resolution is achieved only rarely. And one of the interesting things is it's, it's, it's been a very little value overall uh, for organic molecules. Now, we are somewhere. I mean, typical situation today is the one that you see at the bottom in the middle. That's a thalocyanine, some molecule like this. And we can see the atoms uh, pretty well in STM. What is actually much more interesting about STM, but is not generally taught, is of course that by biasing the voltage between the tip and the substrate, that you can probe below and above the Fermi level. And so you can get pictures, as you see here at lower right for pentacene, you can get a picture of the homo or the lumo of pentacene and of other MOs of the density in that. And that is astounding. And the most direct proof to me actually of the existence of molecular orbitals and of, of their utility. Now, more recently, we've seen atomic force microscopy come to the fore for these, where it's absolutely astounding to see that you could measure piconewton forces. Uh, what you are seeing there is, again, this is an, I'm poor, this is an IBM picture. I, I take it, um, but this is typical of what one sees for pentacene. Um, two nature papers to do this. Um, and you see this very lit up things. And there's a real problem. What you're really measuring is, what you're really measuring is the repulsion of a carbon monoxide molecule adsorbed on a tip for the various atoms. And there is a lot of massaging that converts what you see at the top there into what you see in the middle here. Uh, but what you see in the bottom, in the middle here for pentacene, looks deceptively like pentacene. What are you seeing? The people who do this, with a couple of exceptions, don't worry about this. Uh, and they, it's clearly not the electron density. I showed you the electron density along a BF bond. It's heavy at the atoms. And it's not, is it the bonding density? I don't think so. Uh, there is something very interesting. I think the next years will reveal a language for interpreting these. But right now, I want to be sure. I worked in a crystallography group. I want to show you that the picture at the middle here took two nature papers, and I don't want to know how much money was involved in. And that was pentacene in uh, 2015, about. Down at the bottom is Trotter's structure of pentacene uh, from X-ray crystallography from about 1955. How much have we gained? Uh, so that's, I think we need some reality checks here. There are some incredible things these people can do. Here is from a paper uh, by, in which they can follow a reaction and see a di-radical forming. You have to have a lot of faith in the interpretation. But again, these pictures with, but in general, you can see, you see a lot. Uh, 
you can get something about a reaction. And that is very interesting. Together with cryo electron microscopy, I think we will see more developments here uh, in molecular structures. Okay. So this picture, um, oh, it's a detail of a painting by Raphael in the Vatican. It's a school of philosophers. And at the bottom, at the center of it, there's Plato and Aristotle. And uh, he couldn't he couldn't be sure, even with his learned audience of priests there, that they would know who was who. Um, but I'll tell you who was who. Uh, and they, so they each carry books, and the books have the legible titles of uh, their famous book, the Timaeus for Plato and the ethics for Aristotle, I think. But uh, Aristotle was a, was a really unobserved nature in animals, though he has, he's been maligned for misleading physics for a long time, but that's not there. He, he, he pointed to things on earth. And Plato was pointing upward believed in ideal forms and that what we saw on earth was just a reflection of the ideal forms. Um, Aristotle's the experimentalist, Plato's the theorists, and, and that's in a way the, the breaking point here. Uh, I'm going to look at, in the spirit, of looking at different ways to analyze experimentally. I'm going to look at different ways to analyze theoretically bonding um, that people have come up with. But before I start, I wanted to show you again as part of the entertainment, um, this remarkable thing I found. You remember that Niels Bohr published a 1913 paper on his atomic model. And he, in a first draft of that manuscript, he had an appendix which didn't get published. And the appendix was an extension of the Bohr model to molecules. Now, how did he know about molecules? It's because he had a, a brother and an uncle who were biologists, physicians. So he knew something about molecules. It's very interesting. What You can see what he's doing. There is H2. So you see two nuclei. You can sort of feel what Bohr is going to do. He's going to set two electrons in the H2 molecule in an orbit around the center of the H2. He's going to assume maximum correlation, modern language, the electrons staying as far away from each other as possible on opposite sides of the circle. And then he's going to vary, he's going to see if he can get out of this, the H, he's going to vary the distance between the positive charges and the radius of the orbit around. This wasn't done, uh, Dudley Hirschbach did this, and later it's, it turns out to be not bad. Well, he knew water was bent, but here he draws it as linear, O2. Ozone, yeah, notice the methane structure at lower right. He knew methane was tetrahedral. This is in 1912. The crystal structure of diamond just around done around that time. It was very interesting. Uh, ozone is very interesting. Ozone here is the first time that a physicist draws a resonance structure for ozone, one with a double bond between two oxygens and a single bond between the others, and then the other with a three set, three electron bond in each of the OO bonds. It's actually quite amazing. Um, or, the, or one can interpret it in a way. Okay. 
quantum mechanics, orbitals, two orbitals, chi one and chi two. Let's say they're on unequal energy. Haven't specified how many electrons. I'm giving you here a one, a so-called one electron picture of the bonding in a two center molecule. You can think H2, you can think HF, whatever. Two orbitals interacting. Uh, quantum mechanics always makes the lower one go down, the upper one go up. Now, one thing that's interesting is that in quantum mechanics, and this is something which is important to teach our students, delocalization is synonymous with uh, on, or happens at the same time as there happens interaction and as and with it comes charge transfer so delocalization meaning like orbitals moving over a different space uh, interaction meaning that one level stabilized one up and charge transfer from one to the other. So let's see how this goes because it's it's important. So here is an orbital on the left, chi one, and an orbital on the right, chi two. And now they mix with each other. Of course, they repel each other. Of course, that's that's just quantum mechanics perturbation theory at work. But as a result of that repulsion, the lower one mixes into itself the upper one a little bit. It gets delocalized. It was all on the left. Now it's on the a little bit on the right. And the upper one mixes into itself the lower one with a node, because that's the way it has to be. And now it's delocalized. Well, where is electron transfer? Well, if there were initially two electrons in chi one, now look at the two electrons in the resulting psi one after mixing. And it's clear there must be less than two electrons in the chi one part psi one. And the, instead some electrons have been shifted to chi two. So there's some electron transfer from the lower orbital to the higher one. And in the higher orbital, there is electron transfer from the lower one to the higher one also. Anyway, those, all of these things go together. Whether the resulting situation is stabilizing or not, that depends on a number of electrons. Clearly, when there are two electrons, think H2, it's stabilizing. But you don't have to think H2. You could think uh, chloride and sodium plus just as well. It's stabilized. When both are filled, turns out that in quantum mechanics, the upper orbital goes up more than the lower one goes down. The net result is destabilizing. Think of two helium atoms colliding. OK, you're going to ask me what happens for three electrons. If two electrons is stabilizing and four electrons is destabilizing, three electrons, the answer is it depends. It depends on individual circumstances, the extent of interaction. And that's an interesting general, general aspect, sometime which maybe we'll come back. So this is sort of a simple idea of bonding. Okay, now we go and what we teach our students in high school, what we teach our students in high school is that left, you have now two nitrogen atoms, a 2S and a 2P coming together. You form a bonding antibonding combination from the S's. We teach them that sigma interactions are bigger than pi interactions. So the splitting of the sigma from a sigma star is bigger than pi from pi star. And then we, um, we um, we teach them basic ideas of bonding and antibonding. The lower one is bonding, the top one's antibonding here of the two S's. 
This is bonding, bonding, anti-bonding, anti-bonding. And everyone is happy with N2 occupying. N2 has, aside from its 1s electrons, um, has um, uh, five electrons, each nitrogen atom, 10 in total. They go into a bonding, an anti-bonding orbital and then three bonding ones. The net result of the lower two is zero, maybe. The next one is three bonds, and we're happy with the triple bonded picture of N2, and the relationship between valence bond and between ammo and such. Okay, that's high school. Now, in graduate school, and only in some graduate school, and I hope yours, things get more complicated, always. We, they get more complicated and we learn more from them. What happens is not that complicated, but what happens is that there is another general rule that we, for, let, me, let me put what, hap, what the picture at left is in terms of quantum mechanics. The picture at left is, was done in 1930 and it's been in textbooks since then. What it is, it's a it's a zeroth order degenerate perturbation theory analysis of the N2 molecule. Perturbation theory because the orbitals interact. Degenerate because the nitrogen be between because the P's are degenerate and the S's. So what you do in perturbation theory is in zeroth order, you prepare the orbitals to for bonding by diagonalizing a little matrix for the orbitals that are involved. That's what you've done in the lower two here and in the upper six over here. Um, but this is just the beginning of the story. You are not going to, you're not going to land a satellite on Mars during, using zeroth order perturbation theory. The satellite would miss Mars by the orbit of several planets. You have to do perturbation theory to a higher order. And to, one of the things that happens in higher order perturbation theory, if you insist on doing it by perturbation theory, which is actually how the orbit people do things, if you want to go to higher order, then what you do is you take the prepared orbitals at left here and you use this as a basis for do for interacting further. And so one of the rules in quantum mechanics is if anything can mix, it does. So if symmetry one sigma g here cannot mix with one sigma u. Why? Because they have different symmetry. But one sigma g can mix with two sigma g. And one sigma u can mix with two sigma u over here. Both have the same symmetry. So if things have the same symmetry, they can mix. They will mix. So what happens is the lower one becomes a stronger bond by S, S mixing into P, just put this on top of that and you'll get this. And now there's a terrible temptation to do the same thing for the upper one, but this is like, uh, like woe begone that all the children are better than average. You can't do that. If you do something in the lower orbital, you must do the opposite in the upper orbital. And so, um, what you do then is you convert the antibonding orbital into a lone pair combination that's slightly antibonding still. And then the, uh, the sigma g orbital, or this one becomes actually more bonding than, it was very antibonding, become, I said it wrong, it becomes less antibonding. It's the two sigma g, which is the counterpart of the one sigma g which is the one that becomes, if this one becomes more bonding, this one becomes less bonding. So what you get out of this, so what's the gain? 
The gain is a better description of the electron density, better energy, and a closer correspondence to real chemistry. Because every chemist knows that nitrogen has two lone pairs. And those lone pairs are S and P in character. And here they are. Here is one of them. Here is the other lone pair combination. There was a much more reasonable as lone pairs compared to this and that, which just don't, don't cut it. They don't look like lone pairs. They look like delocalized MOs. Okay, so the net result is that you can no longer count simply bond orders. That is, here, the counting on the left was easy. A bond, an antibond, canceling it. A bond, a bond, a bond. Here, it's a strong bond with a certain number, let's attach to it, a weaker antibond, which doesn't cancel the lower one. But instead, there is a, another little weak, weaker bonding here. So there is, there is actually a, a more detailed interaction. Now, Mulliken actually translated this into numbers. You notice that I've so far, you might think I don't like numbers. And I do. I do. But I value understanding much more. Uh, there's no question about it. So uh, Mulliken put this into numbers. He wanted to define what I have talked about here. I've talked around it. I've talked about bond orders. One minus one, 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 one. And now they're not that. They're something like Oh, maybe, uh, maybe some number like 0.7, um, minus 0.3, and so on. They are big, you sacrifice something by going away from the numbers. Mulliken did it this way. He said, if you have a wave function that is a linear combination of two orbitals, you square it. The orbitals normalized. Every self-respecting orbital should be normalized. You get C1 squared integral V1 squared, C2 squared integral V2 squared, and then you get the cross term. This integral, if the orbitals are individually normalized, this integral is one, one, and this is the overlap integral, the integral V1, V2. So you get that one is C1 squared plus C2 squared plus 2C1, C2, S1, 2. And now comes... Mulliken wanted a measure of bonding. C1 squared and C2 squared are measures of the electron being on center one or being on center two. It's the third term that's the bonding term. Notice it goes, remember what you want? You have a bonding orbital like, which is plus coefficient, plus coefficient. It's got a plus times a plus times Oops, I don't want that, plus an overlap, which is also a plus. And if you have an antibonding orbital, this term has got a plus times a minus, and the overlap is still plus, because it's not the overlap between the signed wave functions, it's the basis overlap that goes in here. So this number here is some sort of bond index. And that's what Mulliken called in the simplest bond index, which he invented in 1955. He called this an overlap population. It's positive for bonding orbitals. It is negative for anti-bonding orbitals. And it is large for large C coefficients and the large S12. Why is that important? If you have a molecule of C2, what is the bond order between the two carbon 1s orbitals in C2? 1s, not 2s. They're both filled. And the, the overlap population actually is slightly negative, but it's not much because the overlap between the uh, wave functions on the two 1s functions are, is very small. 
doesn't is um since that time there have been other bond indices and uh you have seen them people give them names like weiberg mayer and levdeen and the mullican population analysis as an outsider that means an experimentalist facing these what you should recognize from the fact that there is not one measure of bonding, but that there are four measures, is that people can't agree and that there are different measures. Okay, that's the way the world is. It means that there is, and now I'm going to argue at the end that that doesn't mean that there is, that you should look for one. I think that just you should accept that there are different measures. Uh, I will skip this. Uh, I, this is the Mulliken, uh, the Mulliken analysis, uh, which is a kind of extrapolation of the simple picture. I want to talk now about, uh, so this is a Mulliken population analysis, a simple bond index. Now I want to talk about something else. Uh, and this is comes from the work of Bader. Bader, uh, began as an organic chemist, he turned into a very good theoretician, and um, he invented a topological view of molecular structures and a picture of atoms and molecules, which became the basis of another uh, bond uh, index or another way to talk about bonds. Do you remember that BF3 I showed you? This is how the electron density goes in BF3. So it turns out that the electron density is actually uh, goes like this. But if you plot the gradients of the electron density, the gradients go through zero on certain points. Here's, for instance, in BF3 gradient. Gradient is a vector. It's the derivative with respect to three, dis three differences, three distances, x, y, and z. And these lines that you see here are the lines, the contours of the gradient. The gradient has a discontinuity at the atoms. And there is a line of zero gradient of the electron density along a line that is bisecting the line between the two bonds along here. There is a line of zero density which goes up to here and then it bifurcates into, you see here, these areas. It can be proven that there you can define atomic basins which belong to a boron or a fluorine. Like here, you define the inner little basin belonging to the boron, the outer ones to the fluorines. Notice the fluorine basin extends out to infinity uh, in these. And these are... <clears throat> This is a way of defining atoms and molecules. Re turns out that this is pretty independent of the kind of calculation that you do. And he then proceeded to define a bond path, Bader, around 1960, a long time ago, and then later on made it clearer. It's the he defined a bond path, which is the line of maximum density linking the nuclei of two atoms. And he defined a bond critical point, I'll show it to you in another picture, as the point along the bond path where the density is as minimum. Okay, this is easier to see here. The bond path is the line along which the density is a maximum even though it's a maximum, uh, the density is a maximum with respect to two dimensions, but uh, it's 
the density is decreasing along it. That defines the bond path. And the place which is the minimum along there is the bond critical point. Okay, let me, this is now another picture. This is in the space of gradients. It's not as clear as I would like it to be. But what I wanted to say is, I wanted to jump to something which comes out from experiment. That is, I told you that X-ray crystallography got so good that you could plot the electron density. And I believe it when it was done by, by this person. And those are the orange lines. You can plot the gradients. The gradients are just the lines perpendicular to the contours. Those are the blue lines here. You see them? You see they're all heading in toward an atom, just like Bader said they are. There are lines of zero gradient. That's not obvious, but that's the black lines. So the Bader analysis gives you a way to define space as being divided as that space which belongs to oxygen, that which belongs to carbon, and that which belongs to hydrogen. Now, you may not like the way it looks, the hydrogens extend out to infinity, the oxygen extends to infinity, the carbon is in a little constrained thing. That's not what you coming from a ball, you, I, coming from a ball and stick model world, think of atoms, but that's what this picture gives. And then the bond pass is the line from one atom to another one. And the bond critical point is when it crosses that zero contour. And there is one here. There is one everywhere where any chemist would think there should be a bond. You can see how attractive this is in its way, in its peculiar way. It's not attractive in the atoms extending to infinity, but it is attractive in other ways. Okay, then the problem ran into, the model ran into problems. And Bader, Bader was a very argumentative guy. Those of us who knew him will know what I mean. And he is not here to defend himself, but he, he liked, he loved argument. And he very quickly, it came out that when you did calculations on organic molecules, like a planar diphenyl here, biphenyl, or a phenanthrene, that's three benzene rings tied this way, that what you got was, you see the little red dot? That's the bond critical point along the bond path. It's exactly where everyone would want it. The one to the hydrogen is a little weird that it's closer to the hydrogen than to the carbon, but okay, we'll let that go. But here, halfway between the two hydrogens in what is called the Bay region of phenanthrene is a bond critical point. You can see one again over here. And any organic chemist would tell you that those positions in phenanthrene are sterically hindered. And here is Bader coming and telling us there is a bond between those hydrogens. That did not fly well. Um, how do we know it's sterically hindered? Well, you know, sterically hindered is, it's, soft reasoning, but useful. It means atoms getting in each other's way. Organic chemists are not stupid. They're capable of doing, of making almost any molecule under the sun. People made a molecule with two methyls instead of the hydrogens there. Those two methyls go out of plane. No one has made, as far as I know, a molecule with two T-butyl groups in those positions. And no one's surprised at that 
because that's those two positions are in trouble. And atoms getting on top of each other. What really sank the atoms and molecules was a calculation on ferrocene, which, uh, not ferrocene, on buckmasterpullerene, a molecule which, uh, of, to whose chemistry uh, Dr. Roof contributed so much. And some of it is okay. You see these little red dots at the center of every bond in a six membered ring, in a five membered ring. That's okay, but then going out from the central, this is now a helium atom that was put into Buckminster Fuller. Now, a little aside, what do you mean putting a helium atom? Yes, you can put a helium atom inside Buckminster Fuller. Well, how do you do it? You heat the hell out of Buckminster Fuller in a helium atmosphere and it vibrates and occasionally helium atom goes in. Once it goes in, you can tell from the NMR that it has gone in. Uh, so there's no problem. But the calculation shows between the helium and every one of the 60 carbons of the molecule, a bond critical path and a bond critical point. Now, if you try and tell an organic chemist there are 60 helium carbon bonds in helium inside Buckminster Fullerene, you will you will get a good lap out of him. Uh, this is now Bader knew this. He had the same thing for helium, but he he suppressed those things. And so this is um there's still, you can save it. What you can do is take the next derivative, the Laplacian, uh, the second derivative, not the gradient, but the second derivative. And then you can look at places where the Laplacian is negative or positive, and positive is what you'd get for that helium inside C60. Negative is what you'd get for a normal bond. It looks like the presence of bond critical points is tied up to topology rather than to any bonding. So that was, that was let's put that aside for a moment. Let's talk about ELF. ELF was something that came from the physics community. Um, and Becky and Edgecombe wanted, the reasoning was was very chemical in a way. Um, they wanted to have a, to describe a region where they wanted to describe localization. They wanted some functions which would tell you where electrons were localized. So chemists prejudiced by the diagrams they've been drawing for 150 years could tell him very well where electrons are localized. If I asked an introductory chemistry student, where do you find lots of electrons? He would tell me in the cores. He usually doesn't think about the cores of atoms, like the 1s of a carbon atom, in the bonds, and in lone pairs. That's the places where there's lots of electrons. Now, electrons don't like to be next to each other unless they are of the same spin, then you, but if they are of opposite spin, um, what, what he wanted to devise was a something which would tell you where there were it's the other way around. The localization function, localization means that the electrons of the same spin are in that region. So he reasoned, it's hard to calculate that, but he could calculate where you have a high probability of electrons of the same spin. And so he devised a function which would show which would put in a denominator a high probability of electrons 
of the electrons of the same spin. And that would give a, um, a low elf, which a high probability here of the f of r would give a low elf, and that would give very uh, a uh, and the the low uh, f would give a high elf. He devised a measure of this, but since it came from the physics community, it did not. Uh, so this is this is something which, of course, I would advise to anyone. If you invent a new measure of something, apply it to simple things so that you can convince people that it's um, that it's right or not right. It took a paper by Burdett and McCormick, not by Becky and his coworker, to to apply this to simple molecules. And here is what you see. When you calculate this ELF function for, so high ELF means high localization. High ELF, they apply it to ammonia and you get the lone pair. This red area is high ELF. Here is water and you see the two lone pairs of water. For the OH or NH, in ELF, you see these balloons and you don't know what to make them. That's an area of high localization, but why that should be in an NH bond is not clear. And there is another area of high localization very close, which you don't see. It's in the red dot in the middle. Here is what an ELF looks like for cyclohexane. Okay, everyone who has been through an organic chemist, knows the chair form of cyclohexane. Here you see it. You see the little green areas. Those little green areas are the high elf in the CC bonds. You see the balloons. The balloons are typical high elf and CH bonds. Don't know why it's high. Here is cyclopropane, C3H6 seen from the top on. You see the two hydrogens on top of each other. These balloons, and then here you see the CC bonds. And amazing, the CC bonds come out bent. They are, if you follow the high L, or they go in a arc rather than directly from atom to atom. Here is the ELF map for acetylene. The two dots are the localization of the 1s electrons in a carbon. The balloons are the CH bonds of the acetylene. You see this torus? That's the pi bond. Why the sigma bond doesn't appear, I don't know. But the torus is the pi bond, cylindrically symmetrical, of acetylene. Um, it's cute. It takes a lot of getting used to and you have to try it out for a variety of molecules. There is recently another indicator called Ellie, not important. So let's talk about why we should believe. Should we believe what uh, Bader and what the uh, Bader analysis and the ELF uh, tell us? This is really a question of whether one should believe a certain kind of theory. So I've written about this in article in American Scientist a good number of years ago. In general, theories are accepted because they explain more. They fit the fringes with what is known about other parts of the universe. We don't expect chemical bonding to explain elementary particles, but should fit in in some way. And it makes verifiable, preferably risky predictions. What's a risky prediction? A risky prediction is if you take a vote among experts that 90% of them say that the predicted result can't be right. Okay, that's a risky prediction. So, um, and Einstein's prediction of the precession 
of the perihelion of Mercury, Mercury, 110 years ago was was a risky, was a risky prediction. In some ways, what made the orbital symmetry story were believable were some risky predictions uh, of the time. But there are other reasons why people believe theories. One is aesthetic reasons. So this is particularly dangerous. Um, this is a, a simplicity foremost, especially dangerous. The more mathematical a scientist is, the more dangerous they are, the more they are in danger of falling into the belief that these equation, that this must be right because the equations are simple, which really means I understand them, but you don't. Uh, that's a per very dangerous uh, situation. But aesthetic reasons, simplicity uh, foremost is a real danger. Nature is as complicated as it has to be. And it is not as simple as our minds are. Another aspect that makes people believe theories is storytelling. Um, a good story, good narrative, and a good framework for understanding many things. In, in that sense, for instance, the theory of evolution for the first 70, 80 years of its existence uh, yes. was actually, I think, believed because the story it told, the greatest story of them all, uh, the evolution of the species was so was such a good story. There is another thing about social needs of the community, which would get me into trouble talking about it, so I won't. Uh, but Evelyn Fox Keller writes in Making Sense of Life of this. Uh, there are two other things, portable and productive. Theories are believed if the experiment, if anyone, other theorists, the experimentalists, can take it away. They're, if they are like a like a suitcase you can take away. And theorists themselves have the hardest time believing that. They would like the experimentalists to come back to them to ask the question. Then they have trouble realizing that if they make the theory so simple that anyone can use it, that more people will believe it. So that's portable. Productive to me means that Theory suggests experiments. So theories that suggest other theories are not believed as much in the community as theories that, that make predictions of one type or another. So I will give you my own, I, I've written about this. I'll give you my personal opinion. I think quantum theory of atoms and molecules is analytical and descriptive, that's the beta theory. It is not predictive nor productive, and it is not chemical, basically. It fails some very basic chemical tests. ELF is a little better. It can lead to some productive insights. Uh, the solid state work of Yuri Grin, uh, I like very much. It can lead you to some ideas about localization of electrons um, and I, a little bit better on that. I don't have time to tell you about natural bond orbital analysis. This is the, or not in much detail, this is the work of Frank Weinhold uh, over a number of years uh, who has written about this widely. He has a complicated sequence of transformations of the wave function, which is technically rather complicated of going from the wave function to orbitals. It's also very strongly influenced by what you build into the theory. Um, and in general, people, the results because Frank Weinhold and Clark Landis, who has worked with him a lot on these things, they want to talk to experimentalists. 
they um, have structured the theory in a way which is very close to chemical ideas. So when they want to look at a CN bond here in methylamine, NH2, and instead of a hydrogen, a methyl group, you they can form, they have structured the theory so that you can see a hybrid and a carbon, a hybrid and a nitrogen. You can see a CN bond and a CN antibond. And also very important, they have attached to their method a, um, a perturbation theory analysis uh, that it makes sense. So this is a pretty good theory overall. I want to talk about energy decomposition analysis just very briefly. This was the idea, an idea that was in quantum mechanics from the beginning. Surely when you bring together two atoms to form a molecule, surely you should be able to describe the factors that hold the thing together. And so this was done first probably by Moro Kuman, Rauch and Siegler, and then incorporated into a program mostly for molecules. Uh, they go in, in um, they analyze, here's what they do. Uh, I don't expect you to read this. I'll tell it to you in words. When you have two atoms coming together or two fragments, it works just as well for fragments. When they come together, the first thing they calculate is the electrostatic interaction of the two pieces. So if you have a methyl group here and a methyl group there and you're gonna form ethane, they look at the electrostatic interaction of, a, of that methyl group frozen onto that ethane. That always turns out to be attractive almost always. Then the next thing they do is they anti-symmetrize the orbitals of one methyl group to those of the other methyl group. And they call that term the poly, that's the, the first term I mentioned is the, the, the electrostatic interaction. The second term when they anti-symmetrize, they call that the poly repulsion. This is a fancy word and a restating of what you saw in the one electron method as a four electron repulsion. It means that when you bring two levels together, that one goes up and one goes down and the one that goes up goes up more than the one that goes down. And so the, electrostatic interact, the poly repulsion is always repulsive. And then they allow the orbitals of one fragment. Until that point, they have not allowed the orbitals to mix. Now they allow them to mix and they call that the orbital interaction energy. Let me show you what they get, because as usual, it's, it's very hard to say these things, and it's useful to look at two things. Here is, they're going to form ethane, ethylene, and acetylene. This is work of Krapp and Franking. From two methyl groups for ethane, two methylene groups for ethylene and two CHs. And the actual calculated interaction energy is that many, um, uh, and, and I think the units here are actually kilocalories. Now then they look at the poly electrostatic terms and you notice the poly terms are always positive. That's the re repulsion. And the electrostatic terms are always negative. 
And they're not that different from each other. They are different, but they're not that different. Uh, so the fragments attract each other electrostatically and they repel each other with this Pauli repulsion. And then they can analyze this actually orbital by orbital. It's very interesting. But in summary, the orbital, here is the actual interaction energy, 114, 191, 280. Let me translate that into English. A triple bond is stronger than a double bond is stronger than a single bond. Okay. And now, after you get through with this analysis, it turns out it's all in the orbital energy. The orbital energy is the only thing that varies like the actual interaction energy. And the Pauli and the electrostatics cancel each other. And I've seen that time and time again, that the total energy of interaction goes like the orbital interaction energy. And so that's that's their way, a way of, it's a useful way. Uh, I think I have not done justice here especially to elf, I see now, I messed up the explanation. But at least I've given you some sort of impressionistic look at what's out there. What I haven't done, and uh, you'll, it'll, it would take another lecture, what I haven't done is um, uh, bonding in a solid state, extended structures and metals. So I have I have been very molecular, but I have shown you molecular orders, orbitals, bond orders. I've shown you bond indices, beta analysis, bond critical points, L natural bonds, and energy partitioning. I don't want to leave you with these just as different ways though, of looking at it. And part of the story, you, you might think that we're, we're over here somewhere where these two people are going, are just arguing, but there is no solution. And there, there I will argue for no, I, it's not that I'll argue for no solution. I want to argue for a simple view of orbital interactions, which will I think carry you a long way. And I want to show you how that works. I think it is also my way of looking at these things. So that is, and it cannot be applied always. I, when I've done some problems, I have not used this, but let me tell you the story of how, before I reach a conclusion. Here is that C2, and here are these ground state and excited states of C2. I told you there's a range of distances. How do we explain those distances? Let's see, I want simple things. I want to understand how it can, how it is that the first excited states of C2 are all longer than a ground state. But there is an excited state that is shorter than a ground state. And there are some excited states that are very long. How, how, I just want a general picture of this. What can, so uh, what I do is I leave the high school picture here and I go to the graduate school picture here. And then I, I'm not going to give you actual numbers, but in the spirit of thinking qualitatively about it, first, let me show you what is the ground state. The ground state, so C2, the ground state of C2 has eight valence electrons, not 10 like N2, eight. So that fills the first four levels. And incidentally, you can see that the gap to the next level is rather small. And in fact, 
that next level triplet Paiu state is only uh, of the order of a tenth or two tenths of an EV above the ground state is very low. But this occupies a bonding level. This is a mildly anti-bonding level. Pi U I haven't shown you, but it's over here on the left. You can see Pi U is very bonding. So what's going to happen when you take an electron from Pi U and you put it into two sigma G? Now I'm gonna say it in words. And what I want you to believe, which is very for students to believe, that saying the thing qualitatively in words is more powerful than giving me the numbers. Uh, because that's where understanding resides in qualitative pictures of things. So when I take an electron out of a very bonding orbital, that's the pi u, and I put it into two sigma g, which is a slightly, um, I'm sorry, and I put it into the two sigma g, which is a slightly bonding orbital. What I'm going to be doing is weakening the bonding a little bit when I do this, when I take an electron from pi, the drawing is put from pi u to two sigma g, I weaken the bonding a little bit. And that's what happens, the bond stretches in the triplet and singlet of that configuration. The next configuration takes two electrons out of, sorry, two electrons out of here and puts it into that that weakens the bond a little more. Okay, but let's jump to a, how would you get a bond that is shorter in an excited state than in the ground state? The qualitatively, what you have to do is to take an electron from an anti-bonding orbital to one that is more bonding. And that is what happens when you take, well, I guess I have it here, is when you take an electron from this orbit over here, sigma u, and put it into sigma g. Remember, there are eight electrons. The four lowest levels are filled. If I take an electron from here to here, that gives you a one electron out of sigma u into sigma g, it gives you a capital sigma u symmetry state, and it's shorter than the ground state. And how do you get a bond that is much longer than the ground state? You take it, you take an electron, and you have to put it into this orbital, the pi g, which is the anti-bonding pi star, and then it gets to be longer. Okay, I didn't discover this. Mulliken did. Two years after I was born, and I'm pretty damn old. In 1939, you will see this argument made in a Mulliken paper. You can see why people liked MO theory because it made sense in this way of predicting qualitatively. You want the numbers? You got them today and tomorrow you will have better ones with with quantum computers, you will have better numbers. But for understanding, you will have to go back to Mulliken, these things. So that's, that's part of my story also. I want to also show you that 
the story extends to other places. Um, here is a group of compounds, carbides. These are, no one would accuse these of being gas phase molecules, uh, cerium, cobalt, C2, or erbium-10, ruthenium-10, C19. We hide these molecules from our introductory students. The reason is that the world is complex and we don't want them to see things as horrible as erbium-10, ruthenium-10, and C19, or as beautiful. What's the oxidation state of carbon in that? Uh, the, Teaching is a contract between teachers and students to keep the word to keep the word simple. Uh, and uh, but it turns out that every one of these structures, we have crystal structures for. They all contain C two units. So this is of interest to others than us. But we we have done calculations in many of these. Here's, for instance, a beautiful dysprosium cobalt C two. It has layers, as you see, red is carbon, blue is cobalt, and the large balls are dysprosium. It has layers of dysprosium, of not dysprosium, yes, it's dy, uh, between layers of cobalt and carbon. And to an inorganic chemist, I would say, this is a organometallic layer with a cobalt di pi bonded to this C2 and two of them sigma bonded to a C2. Here are the bond lengths from crystallography. Don't count on STM giving you this. This is crystallography giving you the structures and the bond lengths range from 119 to 148. Hey, you remember the C2 distances? The range, you think that's an accident? That these are, no, it's not an accident. And how is one to analyze this? How is one to analyze these distances? Of course, one way, and that's what we did in the papers uh, that we've done on this, is to, to look at the occupation of the different C2 levels that you see at left over here and see if we can make sense in the same way that Mulliken did of that. And we have looked at a few. This is my C2 wheel. This is spectroscopy, C2 in a gas phase. This is organic chemistry. This is organometallic chemistry with C2 being attacked by two tantalum uh, silo compounds. My colleague, Pete Wilsansky made, here's a C2 in the middle of a cluster, here in the middle of another cobalt nickel cluster. Here is calcium carbide. Here is uh, still another one. This is what happens to acetylene on a, on a, um, acetylene on, I think a copper surface uh, rod, I'm not sure, but the two hydrogens are stripped and you get C2 units left over. Um, the, uh, you, uh, nature's trying to send us a message. The message is you call yourself spectroscopists, inorganic chemists, organometallic, solid state chemists, surface chemists. The world is one. There isn't one way to look at it. But not a bad way might be to think about the orbitals of C2 as it happens in all of these. And I am I feel very lucky to have done that. Okay, so now here was my definition at the beginning. We're now close to the end. That sounds so vague, a reasonably persistent, but I hope I fleshed it out for you. There are many experimental and theoretical ways to look at this connection. And I'm not going to give tell you that, even though I've made a pitch at the end for my orbital way of looking at it, I'm not going to tell you that there's one way that's 
that's better than the others. Here are some of the ways we've looked at. And my at the end, I I have a very liberal and inclusive feeling about theory and chemistry. But the discussion continues. Uh, we, let me just tell you what I think. I think that the chemical bond is very central to chemistry. And there are many ways to define it experimentally and theoretically. You saw me more in love with some ways than others, like Santiago Alvarez's ways of using the Cambridge Structural Database or my little orbital interactions. But I am quite I feel quite strongly that this is not the place uh, to look for a still better definition. There, there may be some other definitions, but just think about the how impoverishing in this world it is to, to have an absolute definition that says yes and no. Because at the end, it leaves you with just, with just the feeling that, that you can close your mind. And I'm basically opposed to anything like that. Uh, the concept is essential. It has a history. It has life. It's interesting. It will not be reduced to physics. The Bader episode is, was, in a sense, an attempt to do this. I would say push the concept to its limits. Be aware of the different experimental theoretical measures and just relax and enjoy the fact that a bond will be by some criteria, be a bond and by some other criteria, not a bond. There is just so much richness in this idea. And I'm glad to have told you about it. Thank you. Wow. Thanks uh, very much, Roald. Uh, it's a wonderful lecture. And it's, as I mentioned, since you've given us permission to record, it's going to have some real legs here in Korea and around the world, I'm sure. Um, in terms of <clears throat> your schedule, Roald, it's pretty late there in Ithaca. Would you like to have a few questions? We can have a few questions. Um, okay. I'll be, it is getting late, but I'm okay. I'm, I'm amazed my voice has held up, um, but you can, I'm taking a candy. Okay. We've had someone raise their hand, I think a Steve T. Go ahead, Stephen. Steve, go ahead. I'm not an expert on Ray's hand. Uh, here we go. Uh, oh, he says, I'm sorry, my microphone doesn't work. If you can type the question out, Steve, I'll be happy to read it. <clears throat> and Roald, uh, as Steve might be typing, yes. Uh, lately, our group has been interested in the acetylide dianion that shows. Oh, very interesting. Yeah, it shows up in so many situations, and we're intrigued uh, whether we can get that uh, C2 group to move into liquid metals like gallium. So, ga I mean, calcium is soluble in gallium, but we have a, a salt, an ionic carbide, and what the, you know, the uh, nature of that C2 could be if we could move it into a liquid metal and so on. Right. So something on our mind, just to mention. It's a, it's a, a very interesting idea. A number of ways. Um, acetylene with two 
linked to two metals uh, like silver. Um, these are these are things that can generate a C two um, two minus. Um, you saw the, the the calcium carbide structure is the shortest CC bond that we have, um, but I think. I I think that in in general, um, these one different way to think about these interesting carbides. So all of these have C two units in them. So you could ask the question: Are there any materials that have higher aggregates of carbon than C two in them? So there are just a few compounds that have C three, probably C three four. Um, uh, C3, 4 minus in them. Just a few, including a scandium one, which is very interesting. Um, I think in general, these one way that might be productive to think about these is to think that these are very, they are clearly layered. You see that in that dysprosium cobalt C2 structure at left. Um, one way to, I think it would be very useful to think of solubilizing these. And the way to think about it is it goes into the structure because the dysprosium is such a good uh, Lewis acid for the cobalt carbide two minus or three minus layer that it has. But if you provide a different Lewis acid than this prosium, maybe you could float off the cobalt carbide polyanionic layer. And that would be very interesting to have a two-dimensional organometallic polymer. Um, no one's done that. Hey, thanks very much. We might have another question or two from. Sure. If someone does, just go ahead and speak right up. Yes. Okay. Also, Stephen yeah. is asking a question. I'll read it out loud, uh, Roald. Yes, please. Uh, it's, uh, first, I'm very happy to have gotten this wonderful lecture from you. I'm not a theoretical chemist. You might have lost me a couple of times, but something that I would like to study more in the future besides theoretical chemistry is how philosophy and chemistry go hand in hand, as you mentioned. And I wondered if you could maybe give some literature for that. Oh. Yes. Thank you, Stephen. So, um, first of all, uh, a very liberal definition of philosophy is that um, it's 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 to be reflective about what you do. It's to think about why you do things and how things are. It's not necessarily that it has to be classical philosophy. There is a philosophy of chemistry community. There are two journals, uh, one called Hille, H-Y-L-E, and uh, I've forgotten, the other is called Foundations of Chemistry. Otherwise, a philosophy of chemistry is scattered, but there are meetings also. There are not many people in the area. And... Um, I, you can write to me at some point, Stephen, and I can tell you. But the main thing is just to think about why we do things. And don't be afraid to do that. You may be, you may have difficulty getting it in past the gatekeepers when you write a paper. But there are other occasions. Uh, one interesting thing is that in general, it's possible to get philosophical considerations in in uh, lectures better than it is in 
published papers because of the gatekeeper question. Um, also, there are articles one can write that um, one can publish in some places. If you write to me, I can perhaps guide you in some direction. Oh, thanks so much, Roald. Maybe there's another question or two. The follow-up, a quick question related to what Stephen asked and how you answered Roald, perhaps. Uh, do you think mixed media is timely? Is it already happening, perhaps? Is it better to have a paper where most of it is written down, but at the same time, there might be a video where people are describing and showing in some other ways, and they're saying, we didn't necessarily say it exactly this way, yeah. or writing, or? Yes, I was thinking of something else when you said mixed media. I think we're clearly going to see explorations of different kinds of media. One thing we, uh, one question, one way to phrase the question is are blogs useful in chemistry? Uh, and I'm beginning to see in some areas of chemistry, uh, blogs worth reading. For instance, in my one of my areas of theoretical organic chemistry, there are two blogs, um, one by Henry Jeppa in England and the other, I've forgotten for the moment. Um, now, what's, what's interesting is um, will it's, it's interesting to think about this. If the blogs contain calculations and are explained in an interesting, motivate, motivating way, they still are escape. They still do not have the process of review except through comments. So I guess one has to take the totality of the blog and the commentary on it mm. with, um, but it would be interesting to have a compendium of chemically useful blogs. Um, um, I would hate it if um, they are used to avoid work um, in a sense that um, just thinking is not just, it's doing science is more. Let's see, let me put it another way. The place where reviewers can be of most use, most direct practical use is in getting better illustrations in a paper and in getting citations fair. Uh, the illustrations come because, not because people mean to produce bad drawings. It's, they simply come out of laziness and hurry. That uh, they are, a typical example is you have an axis on a graph and you see on a graph 0 0.17, 0 0.34, 0 0.51. Well, you know that that person has been too lazy to teach themselves how the program gets 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 on there. Uh, also citations, very important. Um, so anyway, um, I think it would be useful to have other media too. Okay, there's an, another question from one of our colleagues, Jung Min. Uh, thank you very much for the inspiring talk. You mostly discuss covalent bonding. Do you have any comments on non-covalent bonding interactions? Um, yeah, so I think uh, I tend to analyze the ionic interactions in a similar way. Uh, I guess I see, though I see that at the really ionic extreme, 
they might be different. What worries me a lot is a kind of double counting where you, you put in ionic interactions on top of already the factors which have determined the geometry. See, what I'm thinking is molecular mechanics programs that add an ionic component from the partial charges that they calculate in an MO calculation. Uh, I, I have some have some concerns about that. Um, uh, we could, there are some very interesting considerations of simple ionic structures in the um, 2023 Alvarez paper, where he goes into something as simple as the sodium chloride structure mm -hmm. and asks how close are the chlorides and uh, to each other well i have also worried about the same question in some uh, simple hydride structures like lithium hydride and others you have a rock salt structure but uh, as you compress it, especially the hydrogen, you build up a band from the hydrogens. Uh, and uh, you have to worry about uh, other interactions than the normal, than just a Madelung energy in those. Um, but it's a good point. I, I have worried mostly about covalent betraying my organic origin, so to speak. Roald, I think it, are you driving home tonight or? Taking yes, I think we better say good night, <laughs> people. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, let us uh, express our deepest, deepest appreciation. I mean, we're so happy to have had you and that you made the time. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you all. I wish I could see you in person and have a drink with you, but another time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Have Bye. Bye-bye. Professor, I would like to stop uh, recording and close the conference room. Is that OK? Yes, yes it is. please. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk today. And drive home safe. Thank you. Thank You're you. Welcome. See you.